Welcome back to the Jackson Center. This is so cool for us to have you here. Uh, it all started with having an interview regarding Albert Speer. Right. And then it subsequently became opportunities where you spoke here at our annual dinner. And then you did, you and I went down and met with Lillian Gobitis Close, mm -hmm. which was a thrill for everybody. And then you did a wonderful opportunity for us to really get to know a little bit more about you last year at Chautauqua, and here we are today. And uh, as I was talking to you offline, our conversation regarding you and your feelings about Jehovah's Witness and the Gabitis case and the Barnett case, which I put vignettes up on YouTube, uh, recently got to 100,000 hits. So you continue to uh, amaze many. So... Welcome. Pleasure, Greg. So, first question that everybody's asked me to ask you. So, you're asked by Fox News to sit down and to do an interview with Donald Trump. And what's your first question? This was Ted asked me to ask this question. What's the difference, Donald, between ISIS and ISIL. Uh, and what would, what's the geography of this so that I can understand it? We're not getting much detail from the Donald. I had him on my program a long time ago. And I remember from his Memoir, it must have been. I don't think it was The Art of the Deal. I think it was before that book. His father built um, affordable housing units in Cincinnati, multiple dwellings, large buildings. And, you know, it's getting tough for me to remember where I parked my car, so I'm having trouble. <laughs> remembering exactly, but I do recall uh, his father used to go around the work site at the end of every day and pick up scraps of wood as a demonstration, I guess, to his young son Donald of the importance of being frugal and maximizing your product for maximum efficiency and profit. And uh, he was very proud to acknowledge uh, that uh, that is where he picked up his inside knowledge of uh, business and making the customer happy and he, being efficient. You were in the business, uh, you know, uh, of uh, shock journalism. Uh, that's the term somebody else used. You didn't, uh, and kind of raising the consciousness level, the conversation level. Uh, is, is Trump in a bizarre way? This is not a Trump interview, but is Trump in a kind of a bizarre way using that sort of concept today just to, uh, for issue orientation? I don't know if he's that calculated. I think uh, he is, this is his natural, if he's criticized, he, he re responds like a killer. I mean, he really pummels anyone who would dare to suggest he's not perfect. I think he benefits also from the, the grayness of the presidential campaign in many ways. I mean, except for Carly Fiorina, he's, he's, you know, he's like the woman who jumps out of a cake and is surrounded by a bunch of men in gray suits. He benefits from the duration of this campaign, which is making people's eyes glaze over. The uh, speeches are pretty routine. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, I'm afraid that boredom is the number one feature of this there's only so much of this you can take. I mean, everybody who's running was born in a 
log cabin that they built themselves. <laughs> and, you know, after a while, you start uh, getting a little droopy. And he, he benefits from his language, his appearance. His, uh, uh, he appears not to care about political correctness, and people love that at a time when everybody else says, God bless, God bless this, God bless that, God bless my dog and my cat. Yeah. Well, after a while, you know, you begin, to wonder, you begin to wonder how sincere they are. And here comes Donald uh, breaking all those rules. He's the best thing that has happened to cable TV. Oh, absolutely. Do you miss cable TV? Do you miss television? Do you miss it? Well, I don't miss the everyday of it, you know, getting the tie and a clean shirt and, you know, making sure that my pants don't look like an accordion. Uh, that always, you know, when, when, I don't know why, but I mean, you know, if we, if we did a week of shows, that would be more than five suits because I had to go to an evening with the general manager's house or whatever. And uh, the shirts and all, and I mean, I just, uh, I've always been impatient with that. I don't know. Call me a shanty Irishman. Uh, I've never, I never got into, uh, I mean, every other man dresses like my wife wishes I would dress. <laughs> so uh, she helps me the best she can. Speaking of which, how's she doing? She's well. She's on... Uh, She's in a play off Broadway, going to open next month, and it's very funny. I'm pleased to recommend it to your attention. It's called Clever Little Lies, and uh, it's written by Joe DiPietro, who's a very clever guy, and I think you'll like it. It's very funny, and it's not war and peace. You know, you you get to go to dinner after the show. <laughs> uh, and I liked it a lot. I mean, you know, so did a lot of other people, which is why it's up now. Do you occasionally pause and, and reflect on, you know, Marlo, of course, Marlo's uh, husband, Danny, uh, just on, on Danny's legacy and, and, and his relationship with you? I mean, it, it was, you know, here you're an Irish guy, older than she, step into their family. Did, uh, did Danny kind of take you aside? Did he, did he treat the relationship as a kind of a, fatherly one or just one where uh... <laughs> well I was lucky um, I had Danny on my program before I started to dance close with Marlo <laughs> and uh, he said he looked at the camera in the middle of the show and he said ladies and gentlemen if you will send me one dollar for St. Jude the hospital that I am establishing in Memphis, Tennessee. A hospital which will not charge any bills to people who can't afford them. If your child is sick, we will care for your child. Well, I think he got thousands of dollars. I honestly don't remember that. Well, right now, I'm his new best friend. Mm -hmm. So when Marlo took me home, uh, I was pretty well established with Danny. At our wedding, he said, I haven't lost a daughter, I've gained a fundraiser. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried about Rosie. Marlo's mother is Sicilian. At Danny's wedding to Rosie, he got up and he said, Rosie, I will love you forever and all my life. I will be faithful to you. I will never cheat on you. I love you, Rosie. You are my one and only wife forever and ever. He looked over in the corner, and his father-in-law was sitting in the corner saying, That's a right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I, um, and I was concerned about Rosie. I mean, I, I had nightmares. You know, she was sitting here watching me on TV, and she looking over at Danny saying, she's going to marry this guy? And that wasn't what happened. She really liked, we got along very well. And the Irish and the Italians, you know, I was not allowed to play with Italians when I was a child. My grandmother would not 
you know, and I gave a speech once about how, you know, you, you're prejudiced and you don't even know it. It's like cancer. You know, you don't always know you have a bias. And uh, my grandmother said, there was no prejudice in our neighborhood. Where did you get this idea? I said, Grandma, who, who were the guineas? She said, the Italians. <laughs> so, uh, it's the world I came out of. But I, I got lucky with both Rosie and Danny. I'm a, I escaped any problem. Talk about the world we came out of, uh, and, and to get to the subject we want to chat about. We have uh, a bunch of students here who come in from Buffalo to get a chance to, to see you. And the time period is really 1985 <clears throat> and the middle of the Cold War, which I was very much uh, conscious of. But they necessarily are not. That's not within their time frame. Can you <laughs> sort of paint a picture of what 1985 might have been like? Well, it was the heart of the Reagan era. era. Um, Ronald Reagan was the epitome of the uh, tip of the sword against the evil empire, which he called the Soviet Union. It all began with the speech that Winston Churchill made in Missouri in the 40s, in which he talked about the Iron Curtain that has descended. So the people who lived behind this Iron Curtain were members of an evil empire. And it's what I grew up with, in having been born in 1935. Uh, the irony is that the Russians fought on our side against Hitler. And most of my generation failed to really process that because the, 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 uh, the prejudice against the evil empire was so great that we couldn't imagine ourselves partnering with the Soviets, and we did. And the Soviets lost millions of people, not only to Stalin, but to Hitler as well. It was a horrible time. And in 1985, uh, Reagan called it the evil empire. And I, as a Catholic, grew up praying for the conversion of Russia. Russia was not only evil, it was atheist. They didn't have God, and we did. So we were superior to the Russians. We spent billions to stay ahead of the Russians in space, in aeronautics, in weaponry. Uh, I mean, it was the whole motive for our military industrial complex. It, you know, we were going to be stronger than the Russians. And then the year I graduated from Notre Dame, 1957, we suddenly heard from orbit a beep, 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 beep. The Russians had put the first object into space. Well, America sat up and said, this is not going to happen. We're going to defeat. So now we're not only going to defeat the Russians, on Earth, we're going to defeat him in space, and that was what triggered our space program. In 1985, in the middle of this prejudice, someone came to me and said, would you like to do a space bridge with the Soviet Union? Well, uh, of course I would, but the Soviets will rig it. It'll be a KGB operation. And they said, no, you can say anything you want. I can say anything I want on this space bridge and they, they won't cut it out, no. Everything I say, yes. So who's the other host over there? The idea was to have 300 Soviets 
in the Soviet Union, and I would have 300 Americans here, and we would, for the first time, have an honest dialogue on the satellite with earphones, simultaneous translation. Boy, that's a nightmare. Good evening, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, uh, and I said, and then I called, uh, they said, Vladimir Posner will be your counterpart. Vladimir Posner, who's that? Well, it turns out that Vladimir had been on Nightline for the first time. His first appearance on Nightline was in 1980. I'm sorry if I'm going too long here, but... Oh, it was great, fabulous. Well, in many ways, Vladimir Posner is the son my mother wanted to have. <laughs> Vladimir Posner was born in Paris to a French Catholic mother and a Russian Jewish father. His father was a devout communist and, in fact, worked for MGM and wanted to bring, he was a very ambitious fellow, wanted to bring the American way of movie marketing to the Soviet Union. That was his dream. So at age five, little Vladimir gets off the boat in lower Manhattan and uh, he goes to country day school in the village, Greenwich Village. He then graduates and moves on to Stuyvesant High School in New York City. Now it's 1948 and McCarthy is looming. Senator Joe McCarthy, who saw communists under every bed. And so his father literally flees. They, the whole family has to flee. And the party is not have a, a, an apartment for him in Moscow. So there's nothing opening up yet. So they go to East Germany. Imagine, from Stuyvesant High School, he goes to East Germany. He's in East Germany, worst time of his life, he says. And I think it was four years later, he goes to Moscow. They land in Moscow, early 50s, and the next week Stalin dies. He has a wonderful memoir, a, a memory of Stalin's funeral in his book, which is called Parting with Illusions, if you care. Very honest book. And he graduates from Moscow University, speaking four languages without an accent, French, German, English, German, and Russian, for, and, and a fabulous translator. He translated John Donne for the entire Soviet population, Vladimir did. For, met, for years, most of his early adult life, he was the only person in Russia, in the Soviet Union, who knew who Joe DiMaggio was. He's literally locked up for 38 years. He can't leave. He criticized this. He was going to go to Canada. He finally got permission. He's in a very ambitious guy. He's like me. He wanted to be somebody. And he, he gets permission to go to Canada. He's thrilled. And he criticized the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan over there. And wham, they cut him. Off. They wouldn't let him leave. And he's depressed and he's miserable and talks about this. So comes 1985, and Vladimir Posner is proposed as the man to host the Soviet side of the space bridge with this guy by the name of Donahue, a talk show host of all things, on the other side. Now, this was a risky thing to do. By the way, did he know anything about you? Not really. I don't think. I, I don't know. Funny, I never asked him that. We met on the satellite. Mm -hmm. really? Hey, Vladimir, hello. Uh, but first, I got to check this guy out because I'm risking my career here. Reagan, evil empire, and wouldn't you know it, and I already had a reputation as a liberal which is not a career-building thing to be in 1985. <laughs> With or, to, or today. <laughs> uh, really. Um, 
I called Koppel. I said, what do you think of this guy? Posner. He said, I like him. And that was, whew, that's the first breeze that I got. Okay, maybe. So I'm saying, you know, I won't, you'll say anything I say, you'll say, yes, we won't cut you. And po, uh, Vladimir, or uh, uh, po, um, Koppel says, they'll rig the interpreters. This is a KGB front. You're being sucked into a, a, a Soviet plot. They'll rig the interpreters. So we sent our own interpreter, our own, uh, they'll rig the audience. We sent our own people to choose the audience. But they went, went, and I didn't want to do Washington, I didn't want to do Washington, Moscow. I thought we'd get all the apparatchik, you know, all those people who talk too much, as I may be doing now. That's great. Um, so we sent our own people. I said, let's do Leningrad, Seattle. We aired on King TV in Seattle, which is owned by the daughters of a guy who owned half the trees in the Pacific Northwest, a very wealthy family, the King sisters. And they were for peace and wanted to, you know, the world to be uh, cooperative and stop all these wars. So off we go. We get it all set up. We, get, we chose the audience. We had more trouble getting into Boeing than our interpreters did getting into these industrial plants in Leningrad. And we finally got the, you know, and the, boom, the, the picture comes up. Hello, Vladimir. Hello, Phil. Do you need each field? And I'm going to prove that this is legit. Because I got everybody out there saying, look at this liberal pointy-headed Donnie who thinks he's in a uh, uh, uh. and I was I mean there's there's a guy like this at every wedding you know brown socks a little too much to drink <laughs> and about six minutes into this thing I said why do you allow old people old men behind closed doors to make decisions for you <laughs> How we've even blown up the world just because of language, I don't know. Why does it say Jew on your passport? You don't have any other notation of this kind. Why is, uh, why is Sakharov, the great scientist, mm -hmm. why is Sakharov in exile in Gorky? Gorky. And the Soviet people were look like deer in the headlights. And the camera panned. And I didn't realize at the time, but boy, I do now. They had never, ever seen anything like this in their lives. Criticizing. And the camera panned. And the people over there, I didn't realize this either, in the control room in Leningrad, stopped breathing. They thought this was the end of their jobs, their livelihood. Whoever's idea was this was. This was heads off time. And somehow we, f we finished the interview and Vladimir was running around. I was running around. The people talked to each other. Somebody on our side said, are there homosexuals in the Soviet Union? And a woman stood up and she said, and the translator said, there are no homosexuals in the Soviet Union. Oh, okay. Uh, this is, what about the Jews, a woman stood up to say. The Jews, the Jews. Why are you always talking about the Jews? And, and what the good does it do to complain? You can spit, you can stand, you can do, and it doesn't do any good. You can see the cynicism, you know, that, why are you even worried about this? It doesn't do any good anyway. You could, there were some really flashes of fascinating uh, insight into that culture and so on. And we finished the uh, tape. It was a tape. Uh, I wanted to tape as much as we could without having people fall off their chairs. 
so that we could cut it in half. And they're terrified over there, Vladimir would tell me later. And they took it to Gorbachev. You should know that Gorbachev came to power in April of 1985. Mm. And in December of 85, we taped the Space Bridge. And what essentially was happening, and I didn't really appreciate this at the time, this was the first expression of perestroika, glasnost, openness, which Gorbachev brought to the new Soviet Union. And they, I mean, these guys were white when they showed the tape to Gorbachev. And it got all finished. And Gorbachev said, this will be our gift to the 27th Party Congress of the Soviet Communist Party. Wow. These guys could not believe what they were hearing. Couldn't believe it. And we went on the air in the Soviet Union in 11 time zones. We had 100 chair, we're the only channel. Vladimir got 87,000 longhand letters. And he will tell you that most of the letters said, where did you get those stupid Soviets? Why didn't you have me on? Those, you know, they were angry at what they saw in themselves. We sold it in about 37 markets. There was much less interest in it here than there was there. After, you know, you know the, the Soviet bear was becoming tame with Gorbachev, so our interest seemed to flag. And it was also true that Americans didn't seem to care much about anything beyond their own shores, at, that, at least at that time. The Soviets. We went back. I did five Donahue shows wow. after that. And I, I remember we had an audience full of Soviets in Moscow in the TV station. And I said, this is 1986. I said, if you could come to the United States, where would you like to come? Hands went up all over the room. One, one man stood up. He says, boy, Huddy Cross, you took it and took it to Disney World. <laughs> Another person said, Osh Libervitsky got to Las Vegas. And a woman in the back row waved her hand. I go running back and she says, Boy, how did you cross to Glen Clyde, Oxford, Mississippi? And I said, uh, Why? He still about to stick with William Faulkner. No kidding. And I said, uh, why? She said, because, uh, oh no, she said, I'm sorry, Mr. She said, Oxford, Mississippi. And I said, why? And she said, blah, 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 William Faulkner. Because, and I heard in my uh, earphone, because that is the home of your great author, William Faulkner. They knew more about us than we did about them. Mm -hmm. We appeared on stage at Irkutsk in Siberia, and they wanted to know, students, how many, how many holidays do you have? How would you answer that? Is the Empire State Building still your tallest building? This is 1985. Are you believers? They wanted to know if we were believers. And I said yes, and they were very disappointed. Well, it wasn't that long after that that Vladimir, for the first time in 38 years, this is a guy who had a paper route in the village, Manhattan. 38 years, gets off the plane. He's going to come to the Donahue show. He's a guest. Limousine picks him up, talks about this. He's driving into Manhattan. And he sees the skyline. And he starts to cry. Mm -hmm. 
He stays at the Drake Hotel, which is where we put all our guests, and he comes to 30 Rock, and we meet for the first time. And on the, on the show, we do an hour. And it was one of the, I mean, uh, Vladimir has since, we've since become friends. Pretty close, really. We see each other almost every year. He just turned 80. Marlon and I went to Paris to celebrate his birthday. He's very, very well known. I mean, he's well known here. In fact, he's, he's recognized more than I am, and I resent it. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I meet a Russian emigre, like, working or, you know, anywhere. You know, they're all over. And I say, you know Vladimir Posner? Oh, Vladimir Posner, yeah. I said, we were in a, Marlo and I were in a, in a line at JFK Airport for customs. And I heard the accent from in the customs booth. And I looked around, and sure enough, his name tag, his first name was Yuri. And I said, the hell with it. I'm not going to say anything to this guy. I'm tired of this. <laughs> and I slid my passport under the window, and the guy goes stamping him, slides it back over to me, looks up, he says, you know Vladimir Posner? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> um, he is the hottest thing in the Soviet Union and Paris. Uh, it's been a fabulous. The arc of his life has just been uh, so dramatic. And he's had to, I've no, I don't know anybody who's had more Solomon-like issues to deal with. Uh, is, was he an apparatchik? Did he speak for the Kremlin, was he a mouthpiece for the KGB? All these things came after him. And I was pretty quick to remind people that every major metropolitan newspaper in this country supported the invasion of Iraq. Now, who's the apparatchik? Um, you know, our, our mainstream media is as much a mouthpiece for our government as Vladimir ever had been for the Soviet Union. Uh, and then, you know, after 9-11, I, I mean, I met a lot of nice people in the Soviet Union. And it's very flattering to be recognized that far away. You met a lady in Minsk, Minsk, in the middle of nothing. It's like a four-hour flight from Moscow. Phew. Phew. Space bridge. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I'm an international personality. <laughs> Marlo and I go from Moscow to Japan. And the interpreters we had hired said, did you do a program with NBC, uh, Donahue and Kids, Kids with Cancer? I said, yes. He said, you're on the front page of the Tokyo News. I said, really? Can I see? Show me my name. She showed me the vertical characters, you know. I thought, Japan. Later that day, we're at a Buddha, you know, statue. And two little Japanese women in the kimonos and the obis, you know, have their camera and they're looking at me. And I thought, you know, they won't leave me alone. I was about to comb my hair. And they came over and handed me their camera. They wanted me to take their picture. They didn't know who they were. <laughs> so, famous fleeting. Uh, um, well, there's a joke about that. You can cut it out if you want. The weekend weatherman is in the, and in the grocery store. And he sees two women over by the produce, you know looking at him and talking. And he walks right over to him and starts to shake his hand. He said, you know where, somewhere along the way, there's a rumor began that celebrities don't like to be no recognized. Well, that's not me. I'm just like you. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be who I am. 
And I'm happy to say, just feel free to come up and say hello to me anytime. And one of the women said, you have our cart. <laughs> so uh, you learn early, or at least I did, <laughs> not to wear too big a hat because uh, uh, there's always somebody more important than you are. Posner, in his uh, in interviews, really felt that your space bridge, Citizen Summit, launched his career. I mean, you had already been established in the United States. You were, uh, the Donahue, Donahue show was a big deal at that time. Yet, uh, Posner, really, his career launched principally because of, of this. Um, did, you get, did he uh, get that sense that now he's, he's a celebrity and, and he yeah. just, you're the springboard? I didn't realize uh, how valuable it had been to him until long after. Mm -hmm. Remember, I'm still in the States, and I, while I went to the Soviet Union, and we went to, I mean, just an opportunity, and with Vladimir as a translator, I mean, wow, this is, you can't get better than this. Uh, and I did, uh, I didn't realize how important it had been to him. But I did come to, I think, in my own very shallow way, began to see the faces of these people. On 9-12, the day after the towers, Pentagon in Pennsylvania, the entire front of the American embassy in Moscow was covered with flowers. You know, small bouquets, literally hundreds of them. And, you know, I really think within the breast of Mother Russia beats a very generous and, I think, very kind heart. You know, the problem is we, <laughs> it doesn't always overwhelm the leadership. Uh, the male leadership of Russia that has a lot of recovering to do. Uh, and that is what I think today is driving Putin to restore this grand nation idea, ideal. You know, this is a very well educated nation with a fabulous culture. I mean, the Bolshoi. Kirov. Um, it's arts and letters are so distinguished, and uh, Dostoevsky, to name only one, uh, Tolstoy. This is a very, very uh, insightful, educated. The, the lines, I remember the lines around museums when we were there were very long. And it's a shame because I think, you know, if we just were able to get over this evil empire and all the prejudices that all of us have, grew up with, and reach out instead of lash out, I think the uh, uh, Russia and the United States could form a very, very productive, useful union, which would benefit the rest of the world. But it's awfully hard to make that point, you know, yeah. you, especially in this, in this, um, in a culture that I think appears to be more interested in winning wars than avoiding them. It's very hard to get past the, we're the greatest, we're the toughest, we're the best, exceptional, exceptional, we're exceptional, exceptional. Well, I think we're exceptional, too, in a lot of ways. But I wish, I think it'd be better if somebody from another country said that about us. During the course of that actual First Citizen Summit, as you mentioned, you kind of got into it a little aggressive. You wanted to be sure that you, the world knew who was, that, that you weren't going to be duped by this or taken advantage of. And it then because I watched at least the 50-minute piece, 
it was a sort of fisherman from Seattle yes. who sort of seemingly changed the tone of that. Could you talk a little bit about that? What did this? he say? Help me. Well, he, he's the guy that's... I remember the incident. He goes, you guys are talking politics. I didn't want to come here to hear, you know, politics side. When I really, I want to know more about you, the Russians, as people, and us. And I know Vladimir talked about how that sort of changed the tone of the conversation. Well, now they were more interested in uh, things that you did individually or, or right. got, got more personal. Yes. Uh, did you sense that the tone change? Uh, yeah. I probably wasn't as perceptive as you were watching it because I'm in the middle of this mm -hmm. and I'm interested in a program that will be compelling. And I've always, you know, the, the worst thing that can happen to me on the air is dead air because I can just hear them clicking off, you know. <laughs> uh, it's a very demanding audience. And in my business, the coin of the realm is the size of the audience. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ensure that, and so I would run. I always did in my regular show and when we, in Seattle when we did the Space Bridge, I would run to the back row, and run to the front row. And somewhere in the middle of this uh, program, Vladimir was running. And he was, I mean, I really liked him and I liked him even more because he fell down. And I thought, wow, you know, that to me, that was like taking one for the team. You know, he suffered a l little bit of a inelegance there, as I had done often. And I liked him right away because he, it told me that he cared about this too. And he wasn't a self-indulgent guy who insisted on, you know, giving long speeches. Uh, so that, that was sort of the beginning of our relationship. But the fishermen in the, in the back row. Yeah, you and know, I'll just, uh, this is a quote from Posner's book. It was almost a failure, but a fisherman from Seattle saved the day. Quote, I wish this wasn't all so political. I think it's a bad way to start. I wouldn't have come here if I would have known it was going to be so political. I thought I'd get a chance to, more, to know more of the political, of the Russian people. This show is one of controversy. And that's what they, the government, is trying to do, said the fisherman. And Posner said, the tone and the mood of the program changed. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> now, yes, now I remember. And I felt a little self-conscious about that. John Denver had done a space bridge. Uh, I, probably the first one. But it was all music and love and uh, let us march together into the future as people, we love our children, you love your children. And I thought, oh, yeah, you know, we can't do this. I mean, nobody's going to watch this. And not only that, it's dishonest in that it doesn't get to what's yeah, the evil empire, the evil empire. And we're building billions of dollars worth of armament. And, uh, but it's true, it did change it. But, I think with my throwing this hand grenade into it, six minutes into the thing, we got the controversy rolling early. And so by the time this fisherman stood up, he, you know, all right already, enough of this. And I understand that. And, uh, you know, it was a good thing that he said that. But it, it came after we had sort of, you know, said, talked about the gorilla in the, in the room, which was the prejudice that existed and the enormous amounts of money both countries were spending. Huge amounts of money. At the end, which was poignant, you, uh, <clears throat> you asked Vladimir to sort of what his impressions were of the events of the day. This is first. This is historic. This is unique. And um, he, then he kind of did a quote and did some English on you. I, I'm, oh, I was so, you know, I, I, under my breath, I said, he, he's in the middle of, he spoke Russian through the whole thing. <laughs> through the whole thing. And he, he's translated in my ear by the translator, who was a translator at Nuremberg. 
and I can't think of his name, a male, older fella, obviously, by then, 1985. And when the woman said, Oxford, Mississippi, uh, uh, and I said, why? And he said, because, she said, because that is the home of your great author, William Faulkner. I heard the translator said, he doesn't know that? <laughs> Talking about me. Uh, um, By the way, the translator was Oleg Troyevsky, and wow. Oleg was a Nuremberg prosecutor who was brought translator. up. Yeah. Translator. Y you mean translator? Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Nuremberg, and yeah, so just to decide. Yeah. Well, he scolded me in my ear. He didn't know he was, the, you know, like he forgot that I'm listening to him. <laughs> uh, oh, this was an experience. Your question was? Well, he then uh, quoted from My Fair Lady. Oh. I mean, it's another case of why I'm so envious of Vladimir. I mean, really, he is, he is a very bright light. He knows so much, especially the Eastern Bloc and the politics of, you know. I mean, he's at home in Prague uh, and so many uh, places. He's in the middle of his final speech, speaking Russian, and all of a sudden, in English, he says, as Henry Higgins says in My Fair Lady, why can't a woman be more like a man? And I thought, you, <laughs> well, it's a family program. And I felt so second rate, you know, not being able to come back in Russian, which would have been fabulous. Uh, but it was another, uh, another example of his gifts. I mean, his, his language gifts just continue to stagger me. Uh, probably because I am a typical monolingual American. And because I spent so much time in the Soviet Union not able to really converse, you know, feel. I wanted to talk to them in their language, and I was not able to. By the way, the, the 25th anniversary of the Space Bridge, whenever it was that, 2000-something, was celebrated at the F Finnish embassy in Washington, Finland's embassy. Off of Vladimir and I go to the F embassy in Washington to celebrate. This is how big this was to the Soviets, then Soviet Union. Uh, Leningrad is now St. Petersburg. And uh, a lot of big shots were there. Um, Hedrick Smith, formerly of the New York Times, and other uh, people, and they wanted to know, what do I, what do I think now? What do I think now? And I said, well, uh, I wouldn't have been so righteous if I had it to do over again. And that uh, I mentioned the flowers in front of the Soviet, in front of the American embassy, and how really empathetic this, the Russian people felt for America after 9-11. They really did care about us mm -hmm. and how we've squandered all that goodwill. Uh, so I got a chance, you know, to try and recover some of my drunken uncle at the wedding posture and was very flattered that, you know, they ran some of the tape. And uh, I began to, that's when I really began to realize what a huge event this was for the Soviet Union. And then when Olga recognized me at, at the opera, uh, Prince Igor at the, the Metropolitan Opera, sitting in front of us, turned around and said, Phil Donahue. Uh, the guy I was with couldn't believe it. Yeah. So it's been a chapter of my life. I'm just a very lucky guy. I, I'm really very grateful. Uh, 
that happened? You know, my I, I, corporate memory is that time period, that Chautauqua institution, of which some folks behind me were part of, um, in was it 1986, Tom, when yeah. they came here? Uh, 1986 was the first time a group of citizens from Russia had come to Chautauqua. So there was a sort of a citizens exchange. I remember Posner being here. I remember the fact that he spoke, you know, in his elegant English and in his sense of humor and the fact that here we are in free America, United States, so glad to be here and here at Chautauqua Institution where you have to go through a gate, you have to show a card, you can't possibly get into it to even see me. And of course, making fun of Chautauqua, which of course was absolutely dead accurate. And the evening's performance concluded with, as you just mentioned, John Denver singing songs, you know, right. kind of a... Right. Peace song. So yeah. we, we appeared in, in Pittsburgh. Oh, did you? Chautauqua, Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, front page picture, Vladimir and Phil on the stage. Big stuff in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, my name tag had Phil Donahue and then Lisi Boutique Bouva, whatever <laughs> it is, underneath. Yeah. Uh, I still have it. Um, yeah. Probably Phil Donahue and Vlad, and then the below it said Vladimir Posner's friend. You think that's probably what it said? Maybe it is. Maybe it is. <laughs> He's the man with Phil, with Vladimir Putin. <laughs> <clears throat> but I, but anyways, I just I got a sense, and I've never had anybody talk about that. You probably what you did in December of 1985 was a springboard for opportunities to happen here at Chautauqua in 1986. It was. I'm and, sure it was. And, and so, I didn't realize the ripples that this caused at the time. Yeah. I was not aware. And since, you know, we see, Vladimir and I see each other at least once a year, and that's something when he's in, you know, and when he, he, Vladimir recently, well, not so recently, four or five years ago, got remarried. Now I'm thinking, well, what if, what if Marlo doesn't like her? What if, you know, you know, now I'm worried about, will the women get along? And so, you know, finally, you know, they met, the two of them hugged and went shopping. <laughs> that is a universal so, language. I mean, uh, Vladimir and I sit outside the store waiting for them. Welcome to the rest of our world. Yes. Uh, you actually, you mentioned the fact you brought him on to your program, and it was the first time in 38 years that he'd actually come out from Russia. You take him to your program. Talk about the program itself. I mean, here, ladies and gentlemen, Vladimir Posner. <clears throat> well, interesting you say he called your attention to something that you take for granted, the gate, the pass. Yeah. He's in the middle of the show, and I said, don't you, aren't you impressed with America? And he said, well, impressed with what? Well, I said, the freedom, you know, the, our free enterprise system. He said, um, when I see people sleeping in the street on Park Avenue, I say, this is not a fair society. And the camera switched to people in the audience. And they were going like this. Yeah. I said, um, so you're a real live commie, huh? I think that was the first thing I said to him. And he, he's in a crouch. He said, yeah. And that's when I moved into the, yeah, but we're free and you're not. The old m m righteous thing, you know. We're better than you are. We have God and you don't. He, they said to him, do you believe in God? And he said, no. Uh, he's a, he said, no, I'm, I'm an atheist, I think. And the audience gasped. He says that now. Mm -hmm. He t talks about this. I said, you're Jewish, yes. I said, were you in Bar Mitzvah? He said, nah. I said, well, you say that with some enthusiasm. <laughs> and he has written about this since. He was confronting his own anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. 
the last thing you wanted to be in Russia in the 60s, 70s, and 80s was Jewish. So he, neither he nor his father really celebrated it or even talked about it. So, not surprisingly, he came out of this experience with a pretty negative idea of Jewishness. Um, I, I, did I mention the uh, Shimon Perez story? No. He's on a ship, I guess speaking on one of those cruises, and he's with Shimon Perez. Oh. And they're sitting, eating one night, and, and uh, he says to Perez, I'm born in France to a Catholic mother and a Jewish father. I moved to the United States. I lived there for a while. Then we go to Germany, and then we move to the Soviet Union. I don't know who I am. And Perez says, Well, if you don't know who you are, you are probably Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> that gets as big a laugh of any of the stories I tell on, on the two of us when we appear together. <laughs> so that was part of, uh, and he writes about it in his memoir, that was part of the, for, when he first appeared on my program, uh, he talks about it. He wore a yellow suit. I taught him how to tie a tie. Vladimir could not write a check. Um, and, when I, and the, you know, the arc of our lives are very similar in many ways. He's, he, his faith was communism, mine was Catholicism. And as we grew older, he began to question mm -hmm. communism. Uh, he now says, he said this in Nantucket. We, we appeared together in Nantucket a couple summers ago. And he, somebody asked him, and he said, I think communism is just a great idea, but it doesn't work. So that's a long way from when he was on my show in 1986. Uh, and obviously, over the years, Phil, the great, you know, the guy who thought he knew all the answers now has more fun asking the questions. You know, and I've come, I now, I'm pretty close to Lord, Alfred Lord Tennyson, my roommate in college. Tennyson, in, deep in a poem titled The Memoriam, I believe, is a line, there lives more faith in honest doubt believe me, than in half the creeds. Well, good old Al, I think, you know, he speaks for me. And so in this way, Vladimir and I share a brotherhood, really. And I suppose that's one of the reasons we, you know, we get along very well. There's, I don't know when we've ever had any kind of disagreement, probably. It's hard to imagine. You can always tell an Irishman, but you can't tell him much. So I'm sure we've disagreed o along the way, but nothing serious. Well, I'm surprised for you to talk about Tennyson being one of your, your close college roommates when I thought Ted Wolf was the closest you had going for you there at, at Notre Dame. Uh, Ted's our Renaissance man. Ted Wolf had, a, had Picasso's three musicians on the wall of his room in his freshman dorm in 1953. And we laughed at him. That's how much culture we had. <laughs> uh, you know, what the hell is this? We didn't. And now he's one of the world's leading amateur astronomers, uh, along with the Coles who are all residents here in uh, the Chautauqua neighborhood. And uh, they both taught me a lot, you know. Uh, I can name some of the moons 
of Jupiter. Callisto, Io, Europa, Ganymede. <laughs> You've just don't, passed, I think. Yeah, don't you people know anything? <laughs> uh, I mean, this is, these are uh, astronomy. Uh, I didn't take astronomy in school. You know, I'm not sure we knew how many planets there were. You know, especially grammar school, you know. Who made me, sister? God made you. Sit down. <laughs> you know, we weren't encouraged to, you know, wonder, you know. Science was a leaf in a dictionary, you know. Something about chlorophyll. You know, the, the, you grew up as a Catholic, and here you've where they exactly gave an example of sit down, you know, say something, sit down, reach sight, sit down. And yet at the same time, uh, your whole career has been kind of surrounding the fact of inquisitiveness, wonderment. Uh, what, was there a tipping point? I mean, think about your early education and now you're in, at, at an age where most people aren't so curious, you're probably the most curious guy there is. Well, I don't know. I mean, I wish I understood it myself. Uh, we came up with Eisenhower. Um, we, America was all good in all things. We defeated the Nazis. We defeated the Japanese who had the temerity to bomb our ships while they were at dock and our men were sleeping. Uh, Lend-lease. The Marshall Plan, we were generous in all things. We were number one in all things. And then, uh, I, I'm honestly, I came, my eyes started to open. I'm a slow learner. I remember we had a, I had a professor from Ohio State as a guest on my program, and I don't even remember why. But we're in the green room talking, and I don't know how it happened. The Vietnam War came up, and he said, there's not a professor at Ohio State that agrees with this war. And I thought, what? Don't agree with this war? Um, and suddenly, very late in life, I began to realize that we were losing a war. We don't lose wars. We win wars. Japan was overtaking us in automotive engineering superiority. <clears throat> Nobody told us they were going to sh shoot our president. And suddenly I realized that we were prepared for a world that never materialized. And so many things began to happen in my head. The women's movement. Children in this country get too much mother and not enough father. This would be on the air with me. And hell, they were talking about me. Um, we, we're we're lashing out rather than reaching out. We're spending two billion dollars a day on armament. Things that go boom. Two billion dollars. I said that. Do the math. And sure enough, if you do, you know, the, the nuclear program, the VA, the, we have 16 spy agencies. 16. And the work is farmed out. Spies aren't necessarily working for the government. They're working for a company that reports to the government. Hell, your neighbor could be spying on you. We don't know. Spying on, they're spying on each other. It's unbelievable. And our kids can't pay back their college loans. So all of a sudden, you know, little Philly's Eisenhower mentality. Roosevelt. Hell, I was 35. We had Roosevelt. I remember we died, Tom Mix on the radio, 
sang his favorite song. I'll never forget that. I used to listen to Tom Mix every night on the radio. And this night he, he sang, Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam. And I thought, wow, this is big. The president is dead. Um, I, you know, and all the, I began to see that so many of the things that I idolized were human too, just like me. And that we had a wonderful constitution. A fabulous, wonderful idea. It's unbelievable. And so in many ways I feel like I'm a patriot because I truly do, along with Robert Jackson, think that the whole construct of the Constitution, the whole power to the people, the checks and balances, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the most loathed, hated religious we didn't even want to call them a religion. They were a sect. They were crazy people. The Constitution protected them. Protected this. They didn't, they wouldn't fight in the war, these bastards. Imagine. Our guys are dying in the Far East and uh, along and with uh, the Russians against Hitler, and they wouldn't fight. We wanted to kill them. And Robert Jackson comes down from on high, holds up his supreme hand, and says, stop right there. Whew. Makes you want to cry. Makes me proud to be an American. I am, I am more impressed now with our Constitution and how lucky I am to have been accident of birth, been born. Imagine, born into this. There are places today where you know you say the wrong thing and your parents will never be able to find you. Maybe at some future date in a shallow grave. That continues. Never gonna happen here and I think it makes it more, I think it makes it more of a responsibility to speak out and use this free speech which has been so hard won for us. When we see power being placed in so many hands, so many few, so few hands, uh, but it isn't an easy sell. It is not. <laughs> uh, dissenters are not, you know, you don't, you don't get a statue for dissent. You get a statue for winning or fighting in a war. It's a shame, really. I remember we were first time you were here. You, after we'd done the first half of the program on Albert Speer, and then you turned to me and said, Greg, when we come back, ask me about Robert Jackson, which you, we did. And uh, you got up and you approached the crowd without any notes whatsoever and recited the uh, West Virginia versus Barnett, constitutional constellation speech, which I remember turning to this guy, Ed Tomasini, the camera guy, and I said, are you getting this? Are you getting this? Uh, and because of, the, and he did. Well, Ed, um, I'm glad you got it. <laughs> and that, that case, the West Virginia versus Barnett postscript is within the last month, uh, Harvard professor, law professor Cass Sunstein ranked the top five Supreme Court I cases saw that. of all time. I saw that. Top five cases of all time. And number one. Numero uno was West Virginia versus... In what Virginia. publication was that? Because I read it. Yeah. I read to Marlowe's. Hey! Yeah, and you were ahead of the curve. You were just... You, you pronounced it that way back when. Again, well, you were ahead of the curve. Well, that was a... Mm. Wow. I mean, this little kid standing there holding on to the pocket of his britches. Yeah. And the nation is coming down on him. Yeah. And it was Jackson who s stopped him. Wow. The and framers it, for, were right. Yeah. What a great, great idea. And I, I just, and I guess it's very personal now, Morgan. So uh, just our opportunity for you and I to meet Lillian Gabitis in Atlanta 
was just a thrill as just as a human being. Just you wonderfully were trying to extract from her this sense of and all the persecutions that was going on with Jehovah's Witness. You must have been. And they were pulling your pigtails. They were hurting your friends. You must have felt some sense of anger. And you, you not that you were really pushing it, but you wanted to get her to say, yes, that was tough times. She would not. She would not. They don't complain. Yeah. They don't complain. And you, you, you remember, she mentioned, and then she backed away from us like she was embarrassed that she mentioned it. There was a girl in her class, seventh grade, whatever, who would, the, the other girls would circle her. The girl in the center was a witness. This is how hated. These are female seventh graders. And they all had pins. And they would poke her with pins. And she would... I mean, I can't think of a more heinous torture to inflict on a seventh grader from her peers. And then she seemed to back away from that. And we, I had read <clears throat> that a witness was castrated. I had a hard time believing that. You know, I mean, a castrated because he was a witness. That's how hated they were. And I said, you know, is that true, Mrs. Govitis? She said, yes, and I saw him last week. <laughs> yeah. He's got a high voice, but he's fine. <laughs> well, I thought, she's putting a positive spin on this. Yeah. Never complain. Yeah. You're doing this for the God King Jehovah? People will beat you. People will beat you up. Oh, my. Hi. Oh. Uh, this guy knows me, Tom Hagen. Um, I think I gave you the wrong date on uh, the Soviet exchange that came to Chautauqua. I got my gate pass here. Um, <laughs> the uh, Chautauqua experience, uh, exchange with the Soviet Union, took place, I think, in 1986. And we went to uh, Riga, Latvia, and Yermola for a, kind of a Chautauqua exchange program. We were held hostage, though, before we went there because Danilov was taken prisoner, the reporter Danilov, in, in Moscow. And until he was released or they negotiated a, a release for him, uh, the State Department uh, kept us in the United States for three or four days, as I recall, in Washington. Finally, we were allowed to go over there. But that was, a, uh, I think, the first time a group of people went into Latvia. At that time, it was a, a kind of a walled off. A we weren't allowed. Of, you weren't allowed, yeah. Uh, I think this was in 86, I'm pretty sure. Then in 87, a Soviet exchange group came to Chautauqua, and many of us took in Soviets into our house for that whole week. I remember we had one man. Uh, who was a, a PhD in Pacific Rim economics, and his partner, and he spoke very, uh, very good English. His partner was um, a, a, a machinist, but he was a member of the Supreme Soviet, so he was an important person. Uh, my wife used to tell him in the morning that if they didn't get up uh, to get to the program on time, the KGB would come to get them. Uh, I'm not so sure how true that was, but I think there probably was some KGB people here. And then I think it was the following year that they had the Soviet-American exchange in Pittsburgh that you had mentioned earlier. So that, that was a, a great uh, experiment, I think. And some people credit that uh, exchange from the United, from Chautauqua to the Soviet Union as a very important uh, point in our Soviet or Russian-American relations. And everybody behaved on the American side, I hope. <clears throat> yes, yes. Not, um, yeah. No yes. drunken uncles. And, and, and uh, <clears throat> it was, uh, uh, it was a, a very uh, a great experience for all of us. Thanks, Ted. Yeah, and there, from what you did, I and mean, what you hear just a couple of testimonials, what happened in 85 was an icebreaker. And uh, did, you get, did you get much, just I suppose, script perhaps? It's over, it's done, people have shown it. You've shown it 35 markets here. Uh, I'm sure there were uh, uh, television uh, reporters, critics, if you will. Uh, 
How did they react to this? What was the feedback you got? Minimal. Uh, I don't recall any. You know, the, the reason that Dan Rather and Jennings or any of the other uh, network people didn't do this because it was, it was too much of a risk to their careers. And that's how they, you know, had to get to the lowly level of a talk show host, um, you know, who didn't have, I, I wasn't working for one of the great networks because to appear to be uh, siding with the Soviet Union could be, could be fatal to the career. But I had already lost my virginity in, you know, many ways because I had, you know, my program featured a lot of free thinkers, communists, atheists, and it was really, these were the subjects that got us into over 200 markets. Uh, and, and, you know, we were bolder because we had less to lose. If I had been on the networks, you know, if, if somebody in Peoria doesn't like me, that's, they, the station can cancel me. But I'm still on in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. On a network, you know, one vice president while he's shaving can end the whole show. So that was the value of what was, uh, at that time, uh, a system of marketing television programs that happened one by one. Syndication, it was called, and not a network. The network had all the prestige, but uh, we had m more freedom, really. Uh, we weren't beholden to one person's prejudice. Just a postscript to the whole thing. You and Vladimir did a Posner-Donahue weekly issues-oriented roundtable program for yes, a few we years. Did. On CNBC. Is that right? From Fort Lee, New Jersey, not far from where Governor Christie closed the bridge, <laughs> the George Washington Bridge. Isn't that a Saturday Night Live skit, too, uh, where they talk about something, something in Fort Lee, uh, New Jersey? Uh, uh, banana, what was her name? Banana? You know, forget it. That's a, there was a Saturday Night Live skit that I'll... I didn't see of, it. I digress. But what was, that, what was that program like? Well, that was, that was fun. I mean, here I am with a real live comedy, you know. And we were like, you know, people were fascinated with Vladimir. You know, it was, it was like... Uh, you know, to say, here you're a real live commie, you know, there was a certain vicarious thrill that accompanied that. Uh, so we had, I don't know, almost a freak status, you know, because all these years, the commies, the evil empire, Gorbachev, or, uh, not Brezhnev, uh, the old man who pounded his shoe on the table, Khrushchev. Khrushchev. Uh, those are the images. Mm -hmm. And Stalin, hardly a positive figure. And here's a real life, you know, a guy with a face, who, by the way, women went for Vladimir. I mean, he'd walk in my office and all the women would stop typing. Uh, so he had that sort of international flair about him. It wasn't manufactured. I mean, it just it was him. I don't think he realized uh, what a dandy he was to many, most of the women, the ones in my life professionally and others that we would meet. And it continues today when we were in Paris with him just a year ago. I mean, he, the chef came out of the kitchen uh, to say hello to Vladimir, you know. I tell you, between Vladimir and Marlowe, I mean, people are knocking me over to get to these people. <laughs> you know. And finally, somebody will turn to me and say, oh, we like you too, Merv. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm not likely to, I'm not likely to be, uh, my grandmother would say, don't be full of yourself. 
And that's not likely to happen now that I am surrounded by these people who create so much excitement when, I, when I'm accompanying them to any public place. And now you accompany uh, Ted Wolf today. This is to preach. Very difficult, uh, yeah, with uh, Ted. Uh, he's got an agent now, you know. You know. <laughs> I speak to him through his agent. Yeah. And, uh, well, Ron Cole's a, also a uh, yeah. celebrity. He's, he draws a crowd. So I, you know, I move among the, the men that were the boys my mother wanted to have. <laughs> these, are, uh, these are the scholars. Yeah. These are the guys who rose, they raised their hand first in school. Well, I cowered in the back row. I don't think so. Hey, this is great. I can't tell you what fun it is to learn about this definite, important slice of history 30 years ago this upcoming December. Uh, and uh, for you to share that, and that obviously has an, an impact on a whole lot of folks. And I also want to just personally thank you for all you've done for the Jackson Center. I mean, you've really raised the consciousness level of the center. Uh, of, of your beliefs concerning some of, of Jackson's views and his willingness to take stands, which obviously even in the Barnett wasn't very popular with his president, uh, who had, had appointed him in mm -hmm. the Supreme Court. So uh, thank you. Thanks to Phil Donahue. Thank you. Thank you. How do you play golf? <laughs> yeah, try to. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all right.